Well, today I want to talk about the haves and the have nots. <laughs> Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Verse 1 says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. And prudent means you look ahead and you plan for the future. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with them to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. There's going to be two kind of Christians in this last day. Those who have the anointing and those who have let their anointing dry up. God gives you a deposit of His Spirit when you were saved. You get another deposit when you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's another level, but then it's up to you to keep that going. And it doesn't matter whether you're a mature Christian or not. I want you to turn to Timothy. Turn to Timothy. Now, Timothy was one of Paul's most trusted, or he was, he was like a son to Paul. Paul was very close to Timothy. But 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Verse 6. So Timothy, he's a minister, he's an evangelist. Rick Renner, who's a Greek scholar, said that at one time Timothy had one of the largest churches. There were a lot of house churches, but there were some churches that were rather large, and many times they would meet in rich people's homes. So Timothy had one of the largest churches, and Paul was talking about his background and his faith in verse 6. The second Timothy chapter one, he said, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you to the laying on of my hands. Another translation says, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love and of discipline, like Katie was saying. We have to be bold in our faith. So if Timothy, who was seeing signs and wonders and all sorts of things, he was, he was in the church in the book of Acts, and Paul told him, you need to fan into flame the gift of God, then I think to us, we need to take special attention to that. Now let's go back to the parable of the virgins. These lamps, all the evidence points to these were torches that were used in Greek and Roman ceremonies, these lamps. They weren't lamps like you're thinking of lamps with a glass on it. They were probably sticks wrapped with oil-soaked rags. Even today, in many traditional weddings in more recent times, they go out to meet the bridegroom with these type of torches. Some evidence suggests that they may have burned for only 15 minutes before the burnt rags would have to be removed and new oil-soaked rags would be needed to be wrapped on the sticks of which they were made. So this 
fire of God, this deposit, this anointing that is within every believer needs to be nurtured and brought to life periodically. We can't live on one experience. So many Christians, they get saved, and oh, it was a glorious experience, and they talk about that for the next 20 years, but they never have another experience with God. And what happens? Well, they're stuck in time, and they get dry. In this day and age, we can't afford that to happen. There's too many things going on. We're in a different day. We're in the last of the last days. How long is that going to last? I don't know. But we can see things accelerating. You can see with the push, have you noticed there's a coin shortage? Have you noticed there's a push towards a cashless society? We've thought about that. We've talked about that for years. And now it looks like it could very well become a reality. Hopefully, we'll have some more time. That's my prayer. Because in a cashless society, every penny you have is tracked. Nothing, you, you can't have a side job with, and get cash. I mean, everything has to go to the bank, and it can be monitored and controlled. And some bureaucrat can come along and just decide that you don't have any, that that money's not yours, or they need to take it. I'm not saying this to put fear in your heart. I'm just telling you how close we are and that we need to pray that we can have some more time. But I believe we are. I believe God's going to, the church is going to triumph. One, one thing for sure, as I said during worship, the gates of hell are not going to come against the church. They're not going to prevail. And that word for gates is not the common word for door. It's a special word for gates that refers to gates in a city. So whatever we can see in our nation that something has been unleashed from the gates of hell. But guess what? It's not going to prevail. Because the church will be triumphant. That's why I think there's been such a push to shut down the churches we see in California. They're not supposed to meet, and there's about 3,000. The last I read, anyway, there were about 3,000 churches that had said, no, we're not going to obey the order. It's not constitutional anyway. Congress shall make no law. Prohibiting the free exercise of religion. That's what the Constitution says. So it's important. So you can feel important today. Because you're needed. Your presence at church is so needed. So what is the anointing? Everybody has it that is a believer. So what is the anointing that we have? I want you to turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, verse 30. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them. Now remember, the book of Hebrews says that everything that was done in the tabernacle of Moses was a type of the, of what, of the heavenly tabernacle. So Exodus 30, chapter 30 says, You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister as priests to me. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generation." It shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportion. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. So that anointing oil was for nobody else but the priests. Now, let's get some New Covenant context. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 says this, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, 
Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and father. You and I have a special holy anointing that the world does not have. It is holy. It is unique. It is special. And that's why the devil comes against the church because he hates the anointing because he had it at one time when he was funneling the praises of God. You can read in Ezekiel and Isaiah. And then he decided that he wanted to be God and he was thrown out. And now that anointing and that authority through Jesus Christ, has been given to the church. And that anointing is power. It breaks every bondage and breaks every yoke. It is the anointing that makes a difference in the church. It is the anointing that makes a difference in your life. That's why it's so important. You have a priestly anointing. Do you realize how special you are to God? That God would put his anointing, the Spirit of God, upon you. And the devil wants to make you think that you don't have anything. That's why Christians are belittled. We're outdated. We're not in with the times. The world makes fun. You get on national news and you say that Jesus is the only way. And, and, the, and boy, if you said, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell, whew, you might be shot. So you may think, why? Why, why do I, why is the devil coming against me? Because he knows how powerful you are. And he knows that with one word, you can send him and his demons gone because they have to go. Jesus. Jesus represents their total annihilation. They don't have any power over the human race except that which people grant to them. Through their sin and through their rebellion. Do you realize that when we allow our flesh to rise up, that's when the devil can take hold of us and defeat us? One thing that Bill Wee said in his 90, I think it was 90 minutes in hell, 45 minutes in hell, was it, mate? 23 minutes in hell, yeah. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) He said, you know, you have no idea the level of hate that the kingdom of darkness has for the human race. Why? Because we took their place. I'm telling you right now, if you know Jesus, you have everything. I'm telling you. Look, I, I, I say this all the time, but I'm rich. Yes, I drive a 20-year-old car, but you know what? I'm rich. And I love my 20-year-old car. I love it. I love it. I love it. I just want to get that antique tag on it if if I just keep it running that long. Five more years. Five more years. See, but that's why the devil comes against you because he hates that anointing. That's why we can worship for an hour and a half and feel refreshed. See, it's the oil that it's like this. I ride my bike, okay? And you need to keep oil on, on the chain. And I always notice right after I oil my chain, of course, you can't oil your chain too much. You have to, you know, no one too much oil. Of course, that doesn't apply to the kingdom. You never have too much oil. But the principle remains, the oil on the chain makes it easier to pedal. The anointing makes it easier to live your life. So it's up to you. Do you want to, you want things to be hard or you want things to be easier? Really, it's your choice. How much of God do you want is how much of God you will get. How hungry are you for the Lord? So our prayer needs to be, Father, Keep us hungry. 
Because we in ourselves, we can't be hungry in our own selves. But the more we spend time with God, the more hungry we can be for the Lord. So don't, you know, don't, don't let the devil shake you up. Don't let people shake you up. God, you know, people aren't the enemy, but sometimes certain people that are, are under the influence of certain things can do things that can be mean to us, obviously, can harm us. I don't know if this is maybe somebody in construction can give me some insight, but I was riding my bike Saturday. I rode it a little later in the morning than I, I normally do. And, of course, I have my worship music on my phone, and, and uh, I have my little app that tracks my mileage and I kind of have a certain goal. So I was riding through Deerfield, and there's a house that's under construction, and there were some construction workers outside working. It's had the, the weirdest experience. And I rode by, and they started making all these funny noises. And I thought, surely they're not doing it to me. It was almost like they were heckling me. But I thought, that's crazy. That's crazy. Right? That's nuts. So I, rode, I did my little road through, and then I rode by and again, and they did the exact same thing. It was like they were making fun of me. And I'm like, my gosh, do I look like an idiot? I mean, what's going on? I mean, Travis, do construction workers hate people that ride bikes? I mean, what's going on here? Somebody help me out here. <laughs> and Katie said, oh, it's probably just the devil. Yeah, that's right. It's the devil. They saw the Spirit of God in me so strong, they just couldn't take it. <laughs> Maybe I need to get a new helmet. Yes, I wear a bike helmet. I never wore a bike helmet growing up. Obviously, it wasn't a big deal, but now, you know, they say you need to wear a helmet. So to be a good example to my kids, I wear a helmet. I've had it for 15 years. Maybe I need to update. I don't know. So, so now I'm just paranoid to go by that house. I hate to say it, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to ride by that house. I don't want to get heckled again. I mean, it's not fun. I mean, I don't even know him, but I just don't, you know. I mean, and then for a second I thought, man, if, if, if I had a, a gun and if I knew there were no consequences, I'm, I'm, I might just shoot somebody in the leg. I wouldn't kill them, you know, just limp around. No, God bless them. I'm sure they were just having fun, right? I mean, it's okay. It's no big deal. So, yes, I got heckled. I don't know why, but I did. But it's the anointing. Paul told Timothy to guard the anointing. Now, that word anoint... In the secular usage, means to rub and to smear, you know, to, to rub. And in the ancient times, oil was used. Of course, it was a, in Israel, it only rains like 40 days out of the year, so it was a dry water was precious. And so the, the anointing oil uh, was good for health. So Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy, Chapter 1, verse 8, he said, This command I entrust you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight of faith. So the anointing helps us fight the good fight. He said, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 says, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. See, the anointing is precious. And we have to guard it. You know, it's like your kids, they're precious to you, and especially when they're young, it's like you just keep your eyes on them all the time. Especially when you're out in the stores and all, because they do snatch kids. They, they do. They just, it's true. We, it's not like it was when I was growing up, and it was during the summertime, and mom said, go outside. I, I don't want to see you till 5 o'clock. And so we just go outside, and, you know, we never told her everything we did. But she told us to go outside. You know, I don't want to see you until 5 o'clock. Well, it's okay. We can do what I want to, to take our 
BB gun, shoot birds and shoot people and whatever you want to do, you know. I guess it's illegal to shoot birds now, right? Is it? I mean, I, I guess you can't just kill birds, but we, we, we didn't care back then. This was in the 70s and the 80s. Well, yes, this, this is 78, 79. We just, you know, saw a bird. All right. So, we have this anointing. It's special, and we have to guard it because the devil wants to rob you of your power. That's the thing. If you're a Christian, but you never walk in the power of God, then you're not really a threat. If the devil can just keep you locked up in a room in fear. But that's not how we are at this church. So turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to give you a key on how to keep that anointing going. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, And do not get drunk with wine. For that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Filled. That word filled means to fill up. It means to round off, to top off. In other words, it is something that you do continually. There are many infillings. There are many experiences. There are many times where we need to encounter God and be filled up with the Holy Spirit. So once we receive the Holy Spirit, and once we receive the gift of speaking in tongues, which is a wonderful thing, Jude chapter 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Just letting that prayer language come out and praying in in the Holy Spirit is essential to our Christian walk. In fact, I would encourage you to do as much of it as possible. Because, now let's, let's go back to the parable of the, virgin, uh, the ten virgins, and I want to point out something that's essential. Matthew 25, verse 4. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. In other words, their lamps were burning, but they had a reservoir. We need to have more than enough. More than enough. We need to be in the flow of the Holy Spirit as much as possible. And you can pray in the Spirit wherever you are. And I pray in the Spirit under my breath in a lot of different places and different times. So you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to be stuck in your prayer closet. You can just be out and about communicating with God, uh, praying. You can pray while you wash your car. Sometimes I pray in the Spirit when I ride my bike, except when I start really riding fast or when I get heckled. Maybe I, maybe I wasn't praying enough. I don't know. But there's a power. The, the, the in the anointing and the Holy Spirit, they're kind of one and the same. If you have the anointing, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have the anointing. But praying, stirring that gift of God in you. Always being aware, staying in constant communication with the Lord. It also gives you power You know the story, but 1 Samuel 16, verse 13 says, Then Samuel took his horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come come upon certain people at certain times, but under the New Covenant, you have it all the time. All you got to do is just tap into it. The Holy Spirit is there. He's there for you. Turn to verse John Chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. He says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. And John was talking about, he's talking about the Antichrist and 
all, and the, all the false teachers. And he said, you have an anointing. So the anointing gives you power and it gives you discernment because you can recognize something that's false. How do you know a false anointing? Because you know the real anointing. Because yes, the devil can empower people as well. The devil can anoint people as well. But you know it's a false anointing because you know the true anointing. How they teach people to recognize counterfeit money, they immerse them and teach them everything they need to know about money and about what is uh, about the correct, what, what real money looks like, what it feels like, what's on it. So when they see something counterfeit, they'll automatically recognize it. It's the same way with the Holy Spirit. The more in touch that we are with God, with the anointing, then all of a sudden we will recognize something that is not of God. Because we will we'll sense it, we'll know that it's, it's wrong, it's false. So this week, don't get drunk with wine. In other words, in the same way that the drunk person consumes the wine, you consume the Spirit. You know, you can't get drunk in the Spirit, too. You realize that? I mean, it used to happen the 90s. We've been watching Riding Howard Brown, and, and we watched Rex, we watched... Some of his older ones, you know, but he was talking about, uh, he, 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 he called up his kids for prayer. He's like, I don't want my kids in children's church looking at some puppet. I want them under the anointing. And so he called his kids out, you know, pray for him. He's just funny. You had to see, he's just funny. I'm not saying we shouldn't have children's church, but I, I just thought that was funny. He just kind of made that little puppet thing and it was just But it's about the anointing. We want to operate and flow in the anointing because it's the power of God. See, that, that's what the devil has been very effective at robbing the church of is the power of God. Yes, obstacles may come, but guess what? It's the anointing that breaks every yoke. And you can plow through every obstacle. When they were rebuilding the temple... That scripture in Zechariah, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. The exiles, when they went back to Jerusalem, they had many obstacles to rebuilding the temple. And Zerubbabel was a, a governor. He was the last man in the line of David and the Spirit of the Lord said, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. And you, and you can rebuild this temple. So you can do anything with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Anything you want to accomplish, God's telling you to do something, you can with the Holy Spirit. You just have to draw upon His power. Why? Because you have an anointing. You have an edge. You have an advantage. It's a special anointing. It's something that nobody else has. So I want to challenge you today. In fact, just memorize or read, just read Ephesians 5.18. Ephesians 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled. And you could really say, but be continually filled with the Spirit. You get filled with worship. You get filled with prayer. You get filled by being around other believers. Find other people who are believing like you and talk about your dreams. Talk about your, what you want God to do. Stir up that, that faith. That is with, stir, up, stir up the Spirit of God that is inside of you. Don't hang out with people who don't have any faith. Who don't want to believe oh that'll never happen God will never do that really well I'll see you later nice to know you so as we close don't get drunk with wine but be filled with the spirit amen and watch God do amazing things in, in your life and in your heart. And you know what? 
you'll, you'll be happier. I, pr- I promise you, if you pray and read the Bible more, you'll be happier. Turn off the news. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And see, that's what we did Friday night. We got in touch with heaven. And you know what? Heaven said, we're moving forward. Heaven said, God is good. Amen. Heaven said, you have all the power that you need, church, to press forward. Because the gospel will be preached. And the devil's not going to stop the church. Amen. So we're just believing for good things. Amen. So let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for your presence today. And we just ask you to bless this time. I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will prompt us this week to pray more and to immerse ourselves in your word. And I just pray, Father, for a release of your gifts over your church, Father. A release, Father, of your creativity, Father. A release, Father, of good things over your church. Let's just lift our hands and receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and bless you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You are blessed. God's favor is upon you, amen. Whatever you put your hand to will prosper in Jesus' name, amen. So let's go forward this week, amen. God bless.